we get that high in the above 68, that's going to start setting the, the short's hair on fire, and they're going to start thinking maybe I shouldn't short here. I want to see a nice, steady, grinding, slow, unnerving. F you, we're taking this thing where we want to go bull market. Tom Luanco is an independent analyst known for critiquing mainstream geopolitical and economic narratives. He's a former research chemist, anarcho-libertarian, and Austrian economist whose work can be found on sites like Zero Hedge, LaRockwell.com, and Bitcoin Magazine. Today, he's an active blogger and publisher of the Gold Goats and Guns newsletter, which attempts to connect the false narratives of geopolitics to viable long-term investment theses. Well, Elon Musk just like shot a rocket into space and caught it and put it back where he shot it off from. Like, you don't think we can't fix the budget? Are the odds high that Washington's going to collapse? Yes. Is it a foregone conclusion? No. If Bitcoin is to be successful, and let's project out in the future 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future if Bitcoin's still around, we may come a point where everybody looks at each other and goes, improvement protocol number blah, expand Bitcoin to 16 decimal places. As opposed to eight. So the Satoshi is now the new Bitcoin. Mr. Tom Luongo, thank you so much for joining me here today and being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, I always like it when somebody actually makes a friggin' role-playing game reference. Like I, that's hilarious, <laughs> actually. So are you know in the re so you know like am I might do I get the do I get to make some like weird I'm not gonna make a DD reference because the hell with that game. Um do I get to make some like weird Torg Eternity reference? Like are, are you know, am I is this gonna be broadcast in the Nile Empire and you know, are the other are the High Lords coming after me. I don't know. What the hell? <laughs> are we Storm Knights or are we, you know, NPCs? I don't know anymore. So they, exactly. I mean, it's, the world we are in right now is so backwards, upside down, mm -hmm. and you know, you're you're always a, a calming. Well, I don't know if you consider yourself a calming presence in the storm, uh, mm -hmm. or some people would, but uh, for someone like me, I, I would making sense, making sanity of the world we are in. Because boy, you mm -hmm. you look in every corner and it is wild. What is going on? Whether it's yeah. politically, the macro. Uh, you know, geopolitics, you name it. Mm -hmm. We there's just yeah. mass chaos seemingly going on. So, you know, five, I'm trying to think it would have been eight years ago, I guess now. But I mean, after 08 happened, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, system, you know, kind of, you know, died, I guess, I don't know, kind of is the best way, but it died, right. And we're just on life support. And, you know, that dead cat bounce. I was in the camp of dead cat bounce. I, I'm a, you know, mid 20 something out of college for a few years, studied playing hockey, playing professional hockey, a lot of time on your hands. Mm -hmm. You're studying a, a ton and you're, you're like, okay, great. Like this thing's going to dead cat bounce. You can't keep printing this money. You can't, you know, we're going straight socialism where we can't, you can't do this. It doesn't work here. And then here we are eight years later and it's just kind of melt up the you know world. And so where, where does this go? I mean, we are, are we looking at a hundred trillion debt here in America in the next decade? You know, like where, where does this line, where do we go? I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing. Like when, when do, when does merit and accountability, I guess that's what I'm asking. When does that resurface in this country? I think it resurfaces in January, 2025. Again, if Trump wins the election, look at the team that he has around him. Look at the people that he's put around him. You know, when he's running ads in Arizona and swing states, unity, not MAGA, unity. And it's a picture of him, RFK, Tulsi Gabbard, JD Vance, Vivek Ramaswamy. Like when you look at that group of people, and you look at the energy and the 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 power of those people, and they're all very powerful, like personalities, not power in terms of you know Snidely Whiplash, you know turning turning dials and Wizard of Oz kind of power, or whatever you whatever however you want to put it, Re, quote unquote real political or uh, you know gun power. I'm talking about star power. I'm talking about um, uh, I'm talking about pers power of personality and power of convictions. And I think these people are all have a sincere conviction and they are in the prime of their lives with maybe the exception of RFK. And that speaks volumes to me because that's a, a level of energy in American politics that we haven't had on, frankly, since Obama was, was, you know, foisted onto us as the Manchurian candidate back in 2008. So now think of it from that perspective that what Trump is doing here is he's setting up, like, okay, I'm going to tear a lot of this shit down and I'm going to hand it off to you folks and you're going to go from there. So we're not going to go to a trillion, hundred trillion dollars worth of debt. Trump is going to propose a whole lot of spending. He's not going to actually, he's going to propose a whole lot of spending and he's going to propose a whole lot of cuts 
as well. I, I forgot to talk about Elon Musk and his Doge, the Department of Government Efficiency, right? Like when you when you put all of that together, and you see what Musk just pulled off with SpaceX the other day, which is like, like I, I don't know about anybody else, but it's, it, as a feat of engineering, like it rivals going to the moon. Hey, we shot a rocket up in the space and then we caught it and we put it over there and then we put it back on the launch pad to be turned around 10 hours later to do it again. Like, like, you know, we, we've been, we live in a tyranny of low expectations world, right? That they've, they've made us think that, well, we can't look up. Don't look up. You know, the asteroids coming to hit the, the, don't look up, look at your feet. Right. And they've been telling us to look at our feet and to demoralize us and everything else for so many years now. And it's fed all these like dumb conspiracy theories. And I, and I mean this sincerely. I've, I've said this before and I have patrons who don't, don't agree with me about this. Like, I think the whole idea, the whole meme of the idea we didn't go to the moon is just dumb. Like, I'm sorry, we went to the moon. It's not that, not that hard of an engineering feat to stick a capsule up in the space and shoot it to the moon. The hard part's getting the capsule up in the lower Earth orbit. From there, it's easy. Like going to the moon is easy after that. Because you're out of the gravity well, and then you know the technology is simple. So, you know, why would you not want to believe that? Why would you not want to tear down one of the greatest achievements of humanity? If you're, especially if your goal is to subjugate humanity and promote your own perception of omnipotence, in the case of the WEF, all of these freaking globalists and all these oligarchs, versus your individual power. They've been telling us for God knows how long now, our two generations, and you're much younger than I am. But even going back to when I was a kid, they were trying to say, well, we can't do any of this stuff anymore. We can't dream big anymore. Like we have all these big problems we have to solve here on earth. Why go, why shoot that money up in the space? I remember people hearing that, say making that argument back in the seventies. And I'm like, what are you out of your freaking mind? Like we didn't spend that money on the moon. We didn't take billions of dollars, load them in the lunar capsule and shoot them to the moon and then leave them there. We spent that money here. We developed technology. We developed all, all sorts of, you know, attendant diamond industries and all the rest of it to support that. And that created, you know, and, and, and you know, anarcho-libertarian, all that stuff. Do I, would I prefer to have seen that done via the private markets? Of course. But we still did it. As a species, we did this. As a society, we did it. And we shouldn't denigrate. We shouldn't, you know, denigrate ourselves in this. And yeah, and, and I think that that's really important that we, you know, we say to ourselves, "No, we can fix this." I mean, I firmly believe that, like, if we put our minds to it, we can shoot people into the moon. We can put people on the moon in 1969 with slide rules and you know and rudimentary computers, right? Well, Elon we Musk just like shot a rocket into space and caught it. And then put it back and put it back where he, where, he, where, he, where he shot it off from. Like, you don't think we can't fix the budget? This, the idea that we can't is just dumb. Of course we can. We know where the money goes. We know how much waste and graft and grift and this and that and everything else. We know that 90% of the people that are saying we can't do this are, are, are people who are either wedded to the idea because they make money off of that and they're talking their own book. Or they're just honest brokers who are just have been so demoralized by the last 40 years or 40 or 50 years that will never change anything. Like, I, I believe that that, you know, I believe in political Malthusianism as much as I believe in actual, I, I believe that political Malthusian thinking exists just like I think that there are, that economic Malthusian thinking exists. So the peak, so I, I see no difference between the peak oil guys. By the way, there's no, there's plenty of oil out there. And the same way that I believe in, I don't believe in the, the peak oil guys are as wrong as the people say we can't fix the budget. The spending problem is we, we can't fix that any more than we than, than Malthus was right about how the population expands geometrically and and the food supply expands linearly. He was wrong about that. We're, we, we're wrong about all those things like oil was supposed to run out 30 years ago. And, you know, I know that Steve Sangelo will be out there right there tomorrow going, oh, you're OEI, you're like, fuck off. Like, I've already, I've, he and I have already like, gotten into it on Twitter, so I don't even give a shit. Like, 
Like, I'm like, no, like, you know, I, last I checked, the Gibbs free energy equation has an enthalpy and an entropy component to it. And you're ignoring the important part, which is the entropy part and only focusing on the enthalpy in order to make your argument because that's why well, hey, maybe it's his business. Maybe it's his, maybe it's his religion. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and everybody, uh, 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 you know, in that camp, I don't believe in any form of Malthusian thinking. I don't believe that because things are work, work today this way, that they're going to linearly continue to work that way into the future and extrapolate from there. That's dumb thinking because the law of diminishing marginal utility always says, well, when we add more of X, we need X less. We need X, we need fewer units of less of X because we have, we have, it's simple, diminishing law, diminishing marginal utility, applicable across all human behavior. I'm starving. I need food. I get a little food. I find some, I find a bush with some berries on it. I eat those berries and I'm okay. So the first berry is the most valuable. The second berry, well, is nearly as valuable to me. The 50th berry isn't as valuable. And the 700th ber berry, I'm like, I'm saving it for tomorrow. Like, that's the law of diminishing marginal utility. And if, you know, and when you see people make arguments like that, always be suspect of their motivations, either because they can't conceive of a solution to a problem, but are too wedded to that, that lack of understanding lack of belief to think that, well, I'm a smart guy, therefore, and if I can't think of the problem, that a solution to that problem can not exist. I know we probably want to talk about specific things, but I'm like, we have to like change the way we think about how public policy is crafted, the way markets operate and everything else. We have to get out of these bad frameworks of saying, well, just because it's Washington has always been corrupt doesn't mean that Washington has to be completely torn down before we can reform it. Washington's not going to reform itself until it's under existential threat of actually collapsing. And then you have to ask the question, okay, are the odds high that Washington's going to collapse? Yes. Is it a foregone conclusion? No. We have to like change the way we think about how public policy is crafted, the way markets operate and everything else. We have to get out of these bad frameworks of saying, well, just because it's Washington has always been corrupt doesn't mean that Washington has to be completely torn down before we can reform it. Washington's not going to reform itself until it's under existential threat of actually collapsing. And then you have to ask the question, okay, are the odds high that Washington's going to collapse? Yes. Is it a foregone conclusion? No. Uh, agency every friggin' time in the face of overwhelming demoralization campaigns every time. And I, and I have, I just have zero tolerance. I have zero tolerance, very little tolerance for those discussions, especially out of professionals, especially out of my, as frankly, especially out of my peers. So, um, because I think it's, I think it's dangerous. I think it, it, it's not helping the people who are lost in this see a way out of it. And that's not our job. Our job is to, to, to guide them through it and to empower them to look for solutions themselves, even if those solutions are very small, personal, or whatever, you know, however, because those little wins at the individual level are what create big wins at the societal level. Because the, because it builds from there and then, and that's the way that works. And, you know, yeah, they could nuke us all tomorrow, but then they don't, then they're king of the ant pile and there's no, and there's nothing left to, there's nothing left to rule over and they get their supply. They get their, they get their, their juice and their, um, and their, you know, neurotransmitters, the dopamine, serotonin and whatnot, whatnot from lording it over us. Well, if they kill us all, then there's no supply for you. And then now what do you do? Well, then they just turn on each other and then the whole thing just collapses and then the raccoons take over and that was not, humanity was a nice idea and we move on. The universe doesn't give a shit. Like, and why should it? Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, I, that, to, to me, like, I don't see, that's why I don't see that as an end game. I think they'll threaten us with nuclear war, but they know that they can't go there and they know they can't collapse the population to a billion people or anything else because the whole division of labor around the world would collapse and it would be Mad Max tomorrow. What, you know, who wants to live in that world? You know? Yeah. Not me. So true. And not them. That's the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. I mean, they, 
for whatever people think, I mean, the billionaires still have to live in the same world too, right? Their, their family, yeah. the people, you know, the people yeah. around them, they still have to live in, in this, in the same world we do. Um, there right. are variants, there are nuanced to that, but yeah, I, I love how you say that. Cause it's, you get a lot of like the black pill on internet or doomerism, but how you outline it is really just realism, right? Like there's a, right. there's gray area in there for sure. And people can get really overly pessimistic, but at the same time, mm-hmm. like you said, like, you got to say how it is. And it's not, you're, it's not doomerism. It's just, Hey, this is how it is. This is where we see things going and we need to, you know, take, take a, a stand on this and we need to change things. So, you know, day after day and over and over again, I think that's where people, it's like black and white to everybody. It's like, no, it's gray area. Like it's, it's just being yeah. realistic about what it is. So Very. I, lo- I love you said that. Um, I would love for you to touch on. It just makes me think too. I, I always talk about and think of the hippie bubble. Um, which is demographics is destiny. That's, you know, Harry Dent and Mike Maloney. A lot of the guys I kind of 15 years ago got into when I was playing professionally, right. these guys reading their books and things of that nature. And you, you just touched on a bunch of it, which was what made me think of it, which is this demographic, you know, shift we're going through the next 10 years, right? Where like you have Elon Musk, you have AI, you have social media for all its ills. It's unbelievable because we can see all the crazy things happening now. We couldn't see that for thousands of years. Right. We couldn't see what the king was doing. We couldn't see what the mm-hmm. the ruling class was doing. Now we can see it in real time. So it gives me great hope, like you just kind of outlined. So I love that you were saying that. I would love for you to touch on, though, like this demographic shift uh, over the next 10 years, 15 years of what you see with technology, you know, Bitcoin, gold, uh, just, the, you know, the, te- the tech s- sector and how this changes as the demographics really change here. It's a, it's a really good question. And it's not something I spend a lot of time thinking about anymore. Um, in general, I just fundamentally believe that. If you're liking this interview, but you're just wondering, you know what, Brandon, this is amazing stuff. And I, I get you have these guests on and they're talking about how orange pilling the world is so great and how Bitcoin is going to take over the world. How in the world do I educate my family and friends? How do I get people to understand what most people just don't care about quite honestly bitcoin trading cards is the way to do that when you open up these cards you see the foil cards you see the chase you see the glossy cards young old boy girl man woman doesn't matter people love these cards it's awesome because they're super valuable by the way amazing little side note however it trojan horses them into the most important thing of the day not politics it's not all the things that we fight about it's changing the money fix the money fix the world bitcoin trading cards is the best way that we have going in order to do that, no matter who you are. You're gonna love them. Playable Characters 10 for 10% off at checkout. Playable Characters 10, 10% off at checkout. BTC-TC.com. You're going to absolutely love these things. Now back to the show. The forces of decentralization always beat the forces of centralization because at the end of the day, centralization costs energy and it costs, and it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's un, it's, that's a non-spontaneous, Reaction again. I invoked the Gibbs free energy equation earlier, being a chemist and a, and a former, you know, and a former high energy physicist, right? And, and I like to look at things energetically that way. And I say, you know, you're trying to, they're trying to push a, a, a ball up a hill or push a dead whale up a beach energetically. And it doesn't work. Like you got to get, you got to lie to everybody to get them to do it, and then tell them that you know, it was a great idea. Uh, why we okay? So we pushed this dead whale up a beach, but why didn't we? You know, why do we do that as opposed to make a fire and then you know collect all the fat and blubber and make whale oil out of it and you know have dinner and you know and then use that to power society, power building a society. No, we're just going to push a dead whale up the beach because you know that's. I, I don't understand it. I don't get it. So what I would say is, like, I love Bitcoin, or at least I love what Bitcoin represents, right? And I've always, I've, I've always were sad. And from the moment I saw the Bitcoin white paper, ooh, back when I had, you know, my hair was black and I had some, um, and my beard wasn't gray like it is now. It was only spotted. And I said, this is exactly the kind of technology that breaks us out of the old um, paradigm because now we have a digital we have a digital asset that is infinitely fungible and that respects private property rights because we don't have to inflate the monetary system to resolve uh, comparisons within the division of labor like I like you know this is one of those arguments that and I was just, I literally just was on with um, uh, Tommy Kerrigan, Dave, Dave Coleman, Jim Kunstler, and this came up. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently. And, 
and I've, I've, I've thought about this going back 15 years, like, like, no, you can't, you know, there's, you can't have any amount of money will not liquefy the economy. Like, that's a lie. And it's a lie promulgated by people on my side of the economic fence. Like, well, you know, okay, fine. If you can theorize that we can run the world on a dollar as opposed to a hundred trillion dollars, okay, how is that going to work? A dollar with a hundred pennies worth of resolution. Really? See, when you say things like any amount of money will, is, is what's necessary. No, no. The market needs an amount of money necessary to resolve all the comparisons that the market wants to make so that people can get, can, can take the goods that they have, convert them into the goods that they want. They can turn what is into what will be, into what they have, into what they need. That is a very, that's a process that is, that isn't simple. It is, but it's not. Because now you have to start thinking about what creates the demand for money versus the supply of money. And those two things are constantly at odds with one another. And so ages ago, I said, oh, now I understand why they ha we had to inflate the money supply, why we create credit money. Because I mean, think about it. We create credit money because we don't have enough actual claims to dollars in the bank. So we have to create fake. We have to make, you know, effectively credit claims on things. And then... And that's effectively expanding the money supply. Well, when that credit doesn't get pulled back because it's still demanded, then that means that it's a permanent expansion of the money supply. Okay. And if they're all dollars with the same amount of, of um, you know, and they're, they're trading as money, well, I got news for you. You've expanded the money supply. And it doesn't matter whether you want, for, you know, 100% reserve banking or, or whatever it is. Like at the end of the day, we can only, divide gold so far. You can only divide the dollar so far. So you either have to have a, you have to have as the demand, as the division of labor expands, the demand for money rises. It may not rise linearly with the div division of labor, but it rises. Okay. I'm not making a, I'm not making a, a again here, I'm not making a Malthusian argument about a one-to-one -one correlation between the expansion of the division of labor versus the expansion of the money supply. I'm saying that one has to expand with the other. And whenever you see the and whenever you see a contraction in the money supply, it's usually because you're seeing a contraction in the division of labor. Why are you seeing that? Well, because, again, we get into Austrian business cycle theory. That's because during the last expansion of the money supply and the division of labor, we in invested in a whole bunch of shit that was, un that was unsustainable. And so that's the boom, then the bust, and then we get, the, and we get compressions and rarefactions in the quantity of money and the demand for money at the same time. Makes sense. Economy reorganizes, people move move their, their activities into areas that are sustainable and profitable, and then we, we, we and then we do the thing all over again. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the natural rate of, of expansion and refaction of uh, expansion and compression of, the, of, of economic activity. Um, as we try different things out and we some things fail and other things succeed and blah 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 blah. Okay, great. Well, you can do that and protect people's claims for money, for the claim to property by dividing, by, sub, by further subdividing the monetary unit. You don't have to make more dollars. You can just divide those dollars by, with more zeros, right? So that, you know, then a dollar can be the monetary unit, singular, in that respect. Um, that's why Bitcoin fixed 21 million, blah, 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 makes sense. As long as we all understand that if Bitcoin is to be successful and let's project out into the future, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future, if Bitcoin's still around and it's taken over and we have the Bitcoin standard bubble. Not that I'm saying that that's going to happen. I'm just saying if, well, then we may come a point where everybody looks at each other and goes, improvement protocol number blah expand Bitcoin to 16 decimal places as opposed to eight. So the Satoshi is now the new Bitcoin. Now what? Because purchasing power should be preserved as along with property rights should be preserved, of course, over time. So in that respect, think something like Bitcoin, the, the general thesis about Bitcoin, 
is a um, is an interesting is an interesting technological advancement over gold, for example. And I love gold, and I love Bitcoin. You know, I love gold because I think the current crop of humans like trust gold more than they trust Bitcoin. That's perception. It doesn't matter if it's reality or not. It's perception. And perception in interpersonal activities is reality. And that's what we have to, like, you know, it, it again, is one of those, like, interesting conversations I literally had this morning, the difference between physics and engineering. Bitcoin maxis like to talk about physics. They're not talking about the engineering of how you build capital markets. And we're starting to see that here and there. And I, I, I think that's good. But I do not believe that... Um, I do not believe that we have even begun to plumb the depths of the plumbing necessary to convert the world off of a dollar or competing, to, you know, competitive fiat system nominally backed by some amount of gold to a Bitcoin standard. I think we're far away from that. And I think the engineering has not been done. I think the engineering has been talked about. I think a lot of Bitcoin maxis would argue if they're listening, will be like throwing shit at, the compu- at their computer screen right now going, Tom, you're wrong. That's fine. I've had them. On, I've had some of them on my podcast, and I can already think about it. But where I think we're going with this stuff is, we won't advance as a species if we do not get control of how we return to proper control over the over value, over pricing, value, and risk, and everything else, which have been destroyed by the current central banking system and the current governmental system, and. Um, that's going to be the hard lesson that we're going to we're going to learn over the course of well the rest of your lifetime. I'm not going to see the the end of it, right? I'm going to see I'm going to see the beginnings of it. But I'm not going to see the end of it. I'm 56. I mean, how many how many good years do I have left if I keep smoking these fucking things, right? So <laughs> I don't know. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll eat one of I'll, I'll smoke one of these and I'll eat a steak today and then not eat for 24 hours and hope that the the scales balance and maybe I'll make it to 80. Now. I don't know. Maybe 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 not. I don't know. Whatever happens, happens, right? You know, well, whatever you, the universe wants Italian. at the point. You get, What's that? You get the Mediterranean thing going. You're Italian. It's a blue zone. So, I mean, they, they live a long time, Tom. So, I think you got a ways to go. So, <laughs> Yeah, but all, but, uh, but, but, all of my, uh, but all of my uncles and my dad were all World War II vets in many ways. Not my dad. My dad was Korea. Yeah. And, but yeah. He, and he didn't even fight. He just played, he just played softball and went, to, and, went, and, and went to radio school. Um. <laughs> But he was a cop for 32 years, and they all led very stressful mm-hmm. lives, and they were all dead by the time they were 65, yeah. except for the two that were architects. They made it into the 70s, into their 70s. Like big friggin' Italian family. You know, all these men fought yes. in World War II, and they all drank and you know coped themselves to death by the time they were wow. in their late 50s, early 60s. And that's just, you know, that's just life. And yeah, uh, I'm not going to sit here and argue. You know, I'm looking at myself as I do this, and I'm like, yeah, I know where all those gray hairs came from. <laughs> so oh man well no i i couldn't agree more though i mean the 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 decimal point uh debate is something that again you know like it like you said that there's the hard cap and then you can infinitely div, you know subdivide it um mm-hmm. and and make though each of those units worth more right or they will be worth more you know, over time right well, and it, but like we said, make them worth more years. no brandon what's important right. is that we make them worth more because we, we go out and we create value with that money yeah. and we take our time mix it with our labor and do the whole john yeah. Locke thing and and we and yes. we make and we build on what what came before and if we yep. and if we stop engaging in capital destructive activities pushing dead whales of a beach and actually convert the whale into whale oil and food and shelter <laughs> well you know that's the que- that's that's the question and you so know true. what they what they have us doing is pushing dead whales up a beach and then saying it's our whale no it's not so, it's our whale yeah right. so, so true and that's and that's a whole it, that makes me think of uh, another question w- to you which is your thoughts on you know people you make a uh, you know they go crazy for kamala's uh, unrealized gains which you know, they introduced that four years ago too. People forget. I mean, we have such quick yeah. attention spans that they introduced mm-hmm. this. They trial ballooned it four years ago, and you know, mm-hmm. they just killed it really quick. Well, now here it is again. They're going to keep doing it, and you know, doing. It. And then the eurozone a couple years ago, they were talking about how much dormant cash was sitting in bank accounts, right? And they're making plans of how can we get that out. So to your point, 
it's there there's going to be these things. I mean, what are, what do you think the lengths they'll go to in the, cause it's a debt based system, right? So they're trying everything they can to pull this cash out of accounts, out of anything, just to get it moving. What are, what are the depths of, of which you think they will end up going? I guess could be the next year or it could be the next 10 years, 20 years, but it's not going to happen in the United States. I'm going to tell you this right now. Everybody who's saying that they're going to do it in the United States, they're crazy. Unless of course they install Kamala, Kamala Harris yeah. and then dare us all to get rid of her. And then what yep. will happen then is that all the red states will split, the bond markets will collapse, blah, 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 you know, all that, all this other shit will happen. But, and that's their gambit. That's actually the real blackmail, folks. It's not, it's not World War III. Europe, they're at, they're, they're already talking about this. You know, we have Frederick Merz, the head of the, the Christian Democratic Union, nominally the German Republicans, saying, well, there's these $2.8 trillion just sitting in bank accounts that we need to mobilize or get, a, or get our hands on. I'm like, yeah. You can start, you can say that because you took everybody's guns. Can't do that in the United States. It ain't happen. So like that, you're feeling froggy, take that leap, Freddie, because you know, what's going to happen then is you're going to walk, you're going to walk out of a cafe and then, you know, you're just going to get beat up like by a bunch of East Germans who are like, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. I already did this communism thing once. I ain't doing it again. You look at demographically where, where, where alternative for Germany is strongest. And you realize that it's in the former East Germany who these people all lived under communism and the young folks, right? From the age, you know, the age cohort from 18, from, from 14 to 29 are all, you know, or 18 to 29 are all voting AFD. So um, they're going to try it in Europe because, you know, they've never had private property rights in Europe anyway. Like, so why wouldn't they? But they've, they, they're not going to try it. They're not going to try it here. They will continue to try and like play around the edges and they will, you know, they always try all balloon the shit. Unrealized capital gains tax, tax nor uh, tax harmonization through OECD rules for uh, for for uh, for corporate rates. Basel three is another one of these potentials. Um, drafting girls into the army in order to fight banker wars and shitholes like Ukraine and Lebanon. No, well, no Lebanon. I mean, I hate to call Lebanon a shithole. Um, Okay, Israel. Um, I, I only say that because I have Israeli friends who also call Israel a shithole. Um, so, yeah, like they've been trial ballooning that shit for years, and they always put it in the mouths of the most, of the dumbest people, of the ones that are easy for the right nominally to dismiss. But those, they're, they're always, so they'll put the really dumb stuff in Maxine Waters' mouth. Right. For example, when they were doing the, the, the draft thing, I remember, I can't remember the, the guy's name, but it was, again, it was one of those politicians from Florida that they pushed through some gerrymandered district and then they handed him the script to read. And then they go from there or when they really want to get, when they really want to get us up and up in arms about it, they hand some dumb thing to AOC to say, like, this is, these people are straight out of central casting. They're designed to, to bait the hook and, get us arguing about stuff that just does that literally does not matter and is never going to happen. And our goal as commentators is to go, I, I choose not to engage in that. Stop doing that, that you don't want us to see. Here's this shiny thing that we're all supposed to react to while they go and do this other thing over here. Or as mad as Tom Hardy put it in Mad Max Fury Road, that's bait. That is. And just ignore the bait and move on with your life, right? Um, and stay on target, you know. I, I say that, and then, you know, the, the Y Wings all got blown up in the trench for staying on target, right? So, you know, it's a, it, it's a you know, I, I can mix metaphors all day long, movie metaphors all day long. But you understand my, my, the, what I'm getting at here, which is that ultimately, we have to become more sophisticated at the techniques that they're putting in front of us so that we can just choose to disbelieve, stay on, you know, don't doom scroll our Twitter feed and then go build something brilliant with our off time. And, you know, the goal for, for people like myself and others is to condense all that into a methodology and a way of seeing the world to then educate and present and then you take from it what you think is valuable and chuck the stuff that you think is stupid or you know whatever and then have your 
and then go about your life. And hopefully I'm going to sit here and make some sense to you to help you demystify these things so that you can get a portion of your life back. Because remember, there's taxing 75% of your fucking income. You only got 25% of your time, your productive time it actually comes back that you got to live your life with, right? 65 to 75%, depending on what country you live in. And they believe that they should get 95%. That's the sad part about it. And like, you know, that time is really precious. And so, you know, I would have never thought that, I'll be honest with you, Brandon, I would have never thought that, you know, I would be doing this to an, to the size audiences that I do with the, you know, the, even the meager amounts of influence that I have. And the reason for that is, is I'm like, this is not, this, people shouldn't be doing this. They should be out there building like bridges and shit. They should be doing like making real things. They shouldn't be listening to some, you know, professional asshole like me, like screaming into a microphone. It just seems dumb, but okay. If you like it, great. I'll make the best and most valuable use of that time when I'm in front of that microphone in order to like get out as much information in the most coherent way I can, depending on, you know, where my serotonin levels are that day. <laughs> no, I mean, you're so effective at it. I mean, it's just because it's a pattern, you know, you are a pattern interrupt to the system. There's so much of the distraction and chaos diversion, like you just alluded to that you you do need a strong, but we're missing a lot of strong voices in society. A lot, a lot of strong men in society we're missing. And that's, you know, when you have someone such as yourself, that it really becomes, you know, a shock to the system in that sense where people are like, whoa, and you, you can't look away um, because mm -hmm. you're, you're saying things. Doesn't mean every single thing is true, but a lot, a lot of the, what you're saying though, right? Like we, because none of us know everything and that's the point. Right. You could no. be all true with everything you're saying, but none of us know everything. But what you do so many times is you're waking people from their stupor, right? Like it's like, hey, go go check what's going on. Do your own research, do your own homework. What I'm saying might jar you, but go do some of your own work to figure out what I'm saying is true or not. I think that's what's so important. Or, um, well, at, or at the very least say, okay, I have these ideas. Mm -hmm. I present them to you without, for the most part, without agenda, other than I want to take down these evil friggin' people that like, that, that, that children, like that's, uh, that's like, that's a no go. And I'd like to stop them doing that. And if they are not children and they want to kill unborn children, and I think that's disgusting. And I think that our high, you know, when you really stop to think about what it is that we're doing, you know, if, if you really need a motivation for what it is that, you know, you, you know, why it is you want to go out into the world, like I saw, I really respect my friend Dave Collum about this is that, like, no, we should be protecting innocence. And these people are attacking innocence at every level. All right. And so, like, that should be our job. And as men, that is absolutely what we're programmed for. And so, you know, I may create this persona. It's not really a persona. This is the way I live in freaking real life anyway. But of this persona of, like, I'm this, you know, ungovernable, unobstreperous ass that sits in my office and smokes cigars and rants into a microphone um, and gives it to you with both barrels as straightly as I can. But at the same time, I may not be, I'm also going to present ideas that I want to seed into the zeitgeist in order to hopefully get some feedback to tell me whether I'm right or wrong. Because if I seed an idea that I'm not quite sure about, I do this all the time and I do it on purpose, which is like, oh, by the way, I'm thinking this might be true. I don't know that it's true. What do you think? And then put it out there and not like the same way you see at the end of every freaking you know shitty youtube video like oh this is my argument what do you think put it in the comments and you know engage my channel so i get an extra 20 sec shekels from freaking google like that's not what i'm doing i'm like i'm literally trying to move the needle societally i give a fuck about that i don't make my money off of you know i don't make any money off these podcasts i do them for free right um i expect the the, the downstream effect is that i've inspired people to want to join the community and do the thing and and hang out and you know, find other like-minded people to create a hive mind to, to in, improve the, the thing. I mean, every day I get up, Brandon, I'm telling you, I, you know, I check my, my private discussion server and I'm like, holy Jesus, are these people good? And sometimes, you know, sometimes they're like, okay, you're going off on it. You know, some of them are going off on tangents. I'm like, yeah, that's not, but there are other times I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I see like three or four little things and I'm like, you get a tremendous amount of satisfaction because you can see them. They already had great insights anyway from wherever their, their background and their, and their experience was. But then they go, oh, by the way, this. And I'm like, yep, thank you. And then two hours later, I'm on a podcast and I'm talking about that thanks to them. And 
you can't do that by yourself. So uh, the, the one thing you were making me think of earlier, um, mm. got a handful of questions here before we end the next 20 sure, minutes. Sure, let's, so. let's, um, let's, let's get to some of those as opposed to me filibustering about yeah, art. No, no, no. Um, what um, central bank's gold purchases, tell me mm-hmm. tell me where they all are with that. That's obviously been a big story the last you know, 10, 15 years, years? since 08 crash. The And I, I feels like, especially being in the Bitcoin community so much, that people are underplaying. I mean, not just Bitcoin community, but everyone. It feels like gold is going to have a lot bigger role to play. And again, I know, you know, take aside from, you know, hey, it's hitting all time highs, you know, right now, gold and stuff like that. Still, I mean, it, it still feels like gold is going to play a much bigger role in society yeah. going forward, whether any of us like it or not, or whoever, you know, I don't care who you are. Sure. It just feels like it's still very, you know, not talked about central banks, you know, buying tons, literally. In oh, yeah, no, yeah, you know, so, so central banks are, it's clearly, as I said earlier, it's like, Look, like it or not, but the current crop of leaders in the world trust gold, they don't trust Bitcoin. Yes. And that's so what made me think of it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's really the best way of, of, of describing it. So when you look at what the BRICS are thinking about doing, and they're moving to a digital asset payment, the digital payment system, which just got kind of pre announced today. And oh, by the way, like my friend Vince Launchy is out there, like all over the story, and he like posts a picture of, of the BRICS pay interface. And it's like all these currencies that you can pay in. And one of them is XAU, which is the ticker symbol for gold. You're like, huh, the deuce you say. Okay, so the central banks are buying gold because they know that they're going to, in order for them to be able to secure physical collateral in the, in the future, undergird their debt or anything else that you know they're trying to do, they are going to need gold. It's very clear that the BRICS are making it a, a clear that they value that as the ultimate collateral for international trade or at least in, you know inter uh intercountry trade and that has really never changed no matter how much globalist shitbags like bernanke want to tell us that gold is an anachronism is and it's tradition he knew exactly what he was doing when he was talking to ron paul 17 years ago like he knew what he was doing and he didn't give a shit but you know he's an academic and and he's a globalist and and that's who Ben Bernanke is and was and will always be. That's not going to change. Gold, the central bank purchases are somewhere between 15 and 20% of, of annual gold production, at the gold demand at this point. Um, the Russians mine, you know, a couple hundred tons of gold a year. None of it leaves Russia. Chinese mine three, another hundred tons on top of that. That doesn't leave the country. And you're starting to see cap, soft capital controls go up around gold in the G7. And um, either in the form of you're not allowed to take it across your borders. You're not allowed to like, you can't like take a hundred ounce gold bar with you onto the airplane. That will get confiscated. At your, it, it, that will not happen. So that's a capital control. And everybody knows it. Okay. So, you know, why do you want to leave the country with a hundred ounce gold bar, friend citizen? What's wrong with America? You know, I mean, that's literally what we're dealing with here, right? So um, that's a good sign because that's the governments having to respond to what's happening in the marketplace where everybody is losing trust in the institutions themselves, the governmental institutions and the existing institutions. They're saying, look, I want reality. I don't want claims against reality. I don't want something that nominally pays a yield, but doesn't really because, you know, they inflate the purchasing power of it faster than the, they measure the, the CPI inflation. Like it's just it's nonsense. Like bond yields are dumb. Like they, they're, they're, they should be they're, like, I complained earlier. I'm like, complained earlier. I'm like, I was on with, again, I was on that podcast with you know, the Kerrigan's podcast. And I looked at everybody. I said, like, it's a fiction that anybody thinks that German bunds should be trading 180 basis points less than American. American debt. That's just dumb. And I don't believe that American debt should be trading, you know, the 10 years should be trading at 4% when it should be trading at 9%. Like, but it's trading at 4% because the markets are faking. So those markets are fake. But then, of course, we're doing this. And on Friday, what, the 16th, 17th, whatever the hell today is, I lose track of the days. 18th. Oh my shit, it's already the 18th. Um, and, um, you know, and gold's going to close this week above 2,700, both in the cash and the futures market. Silver's going to close above 33, um, unless they, you know, bomb at 75 cents in the last five minutes trading and paint the tape, which I expect them to do. Um, 
then, you know, like that doesn't matter. That's just where we're going. And that's a reflection of what's the bid underneath the gold market is a reflection of the central banks. Um, and, it's ref, and it's a reflection of the fact that gold is now being fought over. And it's being fought over at, at, the, at a high level. And again, you know, I hate to bust the, the, the nut of the Bitcoin maxis, but I love Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is being used to, sol- to collateralize the SOFR of repo markets in the United States. That's its primary goal at this point. And Bitcoin is never going to become part of the financial system without it getting some form of imp- uh, some form of stamp of approval from, you know, the monetary powers that be. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just not going to – you're not building a separate system. What you're building is an insurgency within the existing system, which will eventually, if all goes well – and Bitcoin, you know, and the Bitcoin detractors who believe that, you know, that the NSA has backdoors in the SHA-256 um, are, are wrong, then Bitcoin will eventually take over that system or not. We'll see what happens again. But we know that the, fund- uh, the fundamental underlying technology of Bitcoin is something that um, can be replicated and now we're just doing the use case scenario. Even if Bitcoin doesn't wind up being the thing, it probably will be because it's got first mover advantage and all these other things are going on with it. But even if it, even if you just say, even if it doesn't, if you leave that 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 room for um, uh, skepticism, right, which you should do always, then you know we know how to make another Bitcoin. And I said this in 2010. So if the empire strikes back against Bitcoin, we'll just make version 2.0 and we'll move on with our lives. Why? Because that's what humans do. If they want something and they need something, they will create the thing that they will need to in order to express their want and desire. At the end of the day, all governments can do is make black markets. Steal our wealth and make black markets. And then they shoot us for trying to make black markets. That's like government in a nutshell. Fine. You know, we'll make more black markets because black markets are, I think black markets are undefeated. I mean, in human history, black markets are undefeated. And I think that's kind of what we've all been talking about. Yeah, 100%. And that's my, I think that's my new talking point. Brandon, I think that's my new talking point for the future. I just came up with it. Black markets are undefeated. But, you know, there we are. Like, I'm talking to a hockey player. So, yeah, there yeah. you go. It works. What do you, so what do you see the relationship with, Gold and Bitcoin. I mean, you know, obviously they're they're compete. You know, they're competing. I mean, all assets to a sense are competing with each other, right? So, I mean, they're they're yeah. they compete with each other. However, at the same time, they're they're doing the, the same they're things. I mean, what do you what do you see going forward here in the next year for for both asset classes? Even oh, the, they're the both going, they're both going much much higher. Decade. Like the t- today is a perfect example of what's going to happen. I mean, this is where I this is where you get back and you start looking at technical. You start doing technical analysis on markets, and that's why that's why I do what I do the way I do it is in order to try and take snapshots on a regular basis to say, okay, here's my thesis. Here's how it's playing out in real time. Here's what I'm seeing. And then when you see the confirmatory moments, like you saw today, Bitcoin's going to trade, is going to close to, I mean, Bitcoin in my world, because I, I use, you have to pick an arbitrary day for Bitcoin every week to close the market. So I use investing.com because that's what my, because it's free and I don't like, and I refuse to pay Mike Bloomberg $25,000 a year for a terminal um, or 30 grand a year, whatever the fuck it is. But here's Bitcoin today. Tomorrow, you know, it's trading at nearly 69,000, right? Which is a very important technical level in that, in that it's not closed on a weekly basis above 68 grand in a quite a long time. So now we're going to get up. If we go to tomorrow night at midnight when investing.com's, that's and that's the way I look at it. And, for, and that week ends on Saturdays at midnight Eastern time. So if we get that close at that level, even if it's not above the all time high in the 73 grand range, as long as we get that high in the above 68, that's going to start setting the, the shorts hair on fire. And they're going to start thinking, maybe I shouldn't short here. And then they're going to start backing off. And then the bulls will press their advantage, you know, and we'll see, and we'll watch the natural run of, 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 of the guys who are man- who technically are managing the money in the algorithms. Gold closing today in the spot market at 2720 is what I'm looking at now. That's insane. That's a breakout. Silver above 33. 
thirty sorry, thirty-three sixty. So silver's accelerating into the close today. I was fully expecting it to get whacked eighty cents and it just went up eighty cents. Silver's on its way to forty. Gold is on its way to three grand. In the next year, I, what I okay, what I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you now is I can see these markets getting out of control, but I don't want them to. What I want is I what I want is the left wing lock. I'm gonna use mm -hmm. a hockey analogy. Wow. Okay. What I want is I what I want. Oh yeah, yeah, well, dude, I'm I'm I I still hate the New Jersey Devils for playing the New Jersey Hawks. Same. To beat my Red Wings, man. Ninety five. Uh, no. Holy cow. Oh. Yeah. Red Wings. <laughs> Other than Hashik after he left the, the Sabers, let's not have let's not go down. Oh that. yeah. That's a, that's let's, not have that. let's not have that rant about what, the, what yeah. the NHL did to my Buffalo Sabers in you know, 2007 through 2011. Let's just not talk oh, about that because that was so bad that I quit watching the fucking league. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's, that's a whole different podcast, um, Tom. That's for sure. Yeah. You have a Gary so Benning yeah, I, I, that'd be a podcast I'd love to have with you. As, as a matter of fact, <laughs> so but. What I want is the left wing lock. What I want is a game in gold so boring that you know it's going to win, but it's going to win 2-1, 18 shots on goal. Martin Brodeur is not going to have to do very much work and just feel the maybe two, de two decent scoring attempts all night long, and he's going to win the game 2-1, right? What I want is Bill Parcells, three yards of cloud of dust and move the chance. I want $200 up and $100 down. $200 up and $100 down. $300 up, $150 down. I do not want to see, as Jim Sinclair used to put it, a rhino horn on the way up and then a fish hook on the way down. I want to see a nice, steady, grinding, slow, unnerving, f you, we're taking this thing where we want to go bear bull market. I want to climb the wall of worry. I want to let them. You ever see The Princess Bride? Uh, everybody's seen the it. everybody's yeah. seen the princess bride yeah there's that great moment where where andre the giant is fighting the man in black right in hand-to-hand -hand combat and he's like and he's like jumping on on uh on there's a one moment where the man in black has jumped on his you know he's like they're fighting and and this is going on and he says he's like playing with it, he's putting his hand on his head and he's doing all this stuff and he's like i wanted you to think you were doing well that's what I want them to think. I want them to think that they still have a chance to win. How do you beat people who think who have have who have unbelievable assets available to them, who have all this power and who are superior in every way? How do you beat them? You make them keep putting assets on the table when you're winning and to make them think that they can still win. This is how Putin's beating us in Ukraine, for example. It's the same thing with these guys. They think they have all the power and all the capital and all and all this and all the they control of the markets and the political system, everything else, but they can't control gold. And they can't control our, our sentiment. They can't control the central bank of Kazakhstan or the central bank of Turkey or or the Turkish banks, commercial banks, whatever. They can't control those people. And the minute gold drops fifty dollars, they're in on the bid. Bid that motherfucker up. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, we'll, we'll bomb at $75 because we can control the narrative and we can do this and we can write a, a headline in Bloomberg and blah. Fine. You drop at $75 and everybody goes, ooh, gold's on sale on aisle four. Fuck you. Thank you. Blue light special. Like, you know, I, that's the way you have to think of this stuff. You always have to think in terms of that. Silver, on the other hand, is an industrial metal. It's going to, it's a much different, it's a much different um, thing. It's a much different asset class. I don't want to have, I, I'm not making a comparison here for silver. This is particularly about gold because gold is a monetary asset. And we have to think of it in terms of it being a monetary asset. And its demand is 99% monetary. Whereas in silver, about 2% of it is monetary and 98% of it is chips and solar panels and all batteries and all the rest of it. Like it's an industrial metal, folks. It's, it's glorified aluminum, right? It's glorified copper, to be honest with you. So I'm not saying that silver is not you know, great. I don't own some and I don't think, I don't, I'm not saying people shouldn't buy it. I just need to, need to understand and attenuate our ex expectations on silver based on that. So what do I want to see in gold? I want to see, I want to see these markets not get away from themselves because the minute they get, they go parabolic in one direction. That's when, when they let it go, when they, as opposed to sitting on it and trying to camp it down, you want to make them think that they still have the ability to keep it tamped down because once they know that they can't keep it down, that's when they let it get out of control, trap all the Muppets at the, to at the top of the market, 
right? Every fucking headline imaginable, gold's going to 12,000 while it's at three. And then Goldman's in there shorting the market. And then they bring it back down to 24 and they make that spread. And then they, what do they do with that? They reload the coffers to run and to and lather, rinse, repeat. That's what they did for years. They did it all through the gold bull market from 2002 to 2011. They did it during the bear market up until 2015. And they've done it so far up through about 2023. Now we're seeing the grind higher and they're getting unnerved by it because the world has changed because in, in some respects, as a geopolitical tool to, tr- to force policy change from... Ru- Russia, China, and the BRICS are using gold as a means by which to force policy change on Europe and the United States and the city of London. And when you start to see it like that, then you understand why it is. I'm like, oh no, we need to unnerve these people because that's how we're going to beat them. Okay. And my goal is to win. And I don't care if I win ugly. As a matter of fact, winning ugly is the best... It's still like it's still a win in the you know it's still a win it doesn't matter how you it's a win and winning ugly is is a way of not only winning but demoralizing them and they don't believe they can be demoralized they think they control the demoral the the, the axis of demoralization I'm like ah oh, no, no. everything is an asset beat them and then as they're losing and again and then I can make other arguments that I've made in the past, like why, you know, what happens when the Fed decides, well, that's how we're going to recapitalize the United States. Would $9,000 gold be good for the Fed? The Fed owns 8,100 tons of gold. I don't buy this argument that we don't, the Fed's, the, 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 the gold's not in Fort Knox. I don't buy that. I don't buy that for a moment. There's 8,133.5 tons of gold under the Marinaricals building or in Fort Knox and the stash around and it's guarded. And I don't think it's gone. And where did it go? You think it went to China? No. China's got 20,000 tons of gold. What the hell did they need our 8,100 tons for? The people who want it are in Europe. Because they've always wanted it. Because they want their colonies back. Because that's who they are. When you know who they are, you know what they're going to do. And you know what they're trying to do. And ever forget that. The Chinese are very transactional people. They'll make a deal with us tomorrow. Trump understands this. And... It's the people in Europe that don't make that that don't cut deals. They're the ones that start wars to take other people's shit. That's the history of Europe, and it's very very freaking clear. And so many people in this in, in this space need to wrap their fucking heads around that and make their peace with it and dispense with all of their prejudices, be it against Americans or, in my case, British or Jews, or anybody else. It's not about that. It's about power, and it's about colonialism, and it's about collateral. It's always about collateral. And they don't have any. We do. The bricks do. They don't. That's the game. Nice and simple. And, you know, in, in, in this round-robin hockey tournament, they're going to lose every freaking game if we show up and play to our, to our ability, to the best of our ability. And if we don't, well, then we're going to lose. But we're not going to lose. There's no freaking way. I mean, yeah, the Finns play a great game of hockey. I mean, they do. (laughs) They play a great game of hockey. I love the way the Finns play hockey. The Germans, nah. nah, I don't like the way the Germans play hockey. Um, The Russians play a beautiful game. But uh, we can keep that metaphor going all day long. They do. That'll be that'll be for the that'll be the next pod for sure, Tom. What um mm. in saying that, I like I uh, in hockey there's always a saying of like you were alluding to earlier, they don't say how, they just say how many, right? They don't care how you win or they don't say how you scored. It's just how many goals did you score? So That's right. uh yeah. Like you, manufacture a goal. How many times have you heard a freaking coach go out there and how are we gonna manufacture a goal? Exactly. I don't know. And you know, and you go out and you do it, right? And you draw it up on the exactly. board and you hope and you hope it works and you hope people execute. So you go out true. there and execute. You, Exactly. Do you um do you subscribe to last last one or two here? Do you have um what are your thoughts, if any, on like the grand chessboard? I, I have yet to read the book, but just like the the island of of the geopolitical nature, obviously of you know just the the Belt and Road, and what's going on there, the you know the old Silk Road, just and how those continents obviously can really do what they need to do, and then we're off just in this island over here. Do you have any any 
brief thoughts on that at all and just kind of how you see and not not in this not not today not with the not with the technology we have in shipping and all the rest of it mm-hmm. i think the united states is a, is a very privileged position north america and it's in general is in a very in north and south america in a very privileged position but remember a lot of those ideas were generated by a tiny little island that wanted to control that was a maritime power i.e britain okay and so a lot of those ideas are ge- are were gestated there in support of those ideas, and uh, and in support of that country's particular imperatives. Um, and so the rest of it is just is on again. It just comes down to collateral. They don't have any. We do. The Russians do. To a lesser extent, the Chinese do. Asia does. That's where the collateral is. They know it. They've always known it. You know. And the, the, now the question is, and obviously there's collateral in Africa and everywhere else. And the, 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 the question, as always, is are we willing to actually cut a deal so that everybody gets cut in fairly? All the BRICs are asking for, all the former colonies in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Sahel region, all, even in the United States and everywhere else, everybody's just asking for to be cut in fairly. Like, you know... And then let's just get back to, you know, you know, let's just get back to making babies and, and, and building cool shit and then watching Elon Musk, like, send a rocket in, the, uh, in space and then catching it. And that shit's cool, right? And we should, you know, we should want to do more than that. And we should stop trying to, you know, we should stop trying to think of the world as a zero-sum game because it's not. Again, go back to the beginning of the podcast. Malthusian thinking is a zero-sum game. In order for me to win, you have to lose. It is not the way this works. Okay, it's a, life is not a hockey game. Trading is a hockey game. Life is not a hockey game. Life is a it, life is an accretive process of building on the past to a better tomorrow for more people. It's a fundamentally a different thing. Like, and you know, I'm sorry, and you know, we can out and we can toil to beat the depreciation and curve and to beat the forces of entropy, but we have to continually put our best effort towards stop pushing a dead whale up a beach and turn the fucking whale into oil, food and shelter. Like that's it. It's not that tough and um, work together to do those things as opposed to expending ourselves for in the, in the service of other people or more appropriately pushing that dead whale up a beach so that some guy can stand there and force you to cut that whale down, do all that. And then he gets to take everything and he hands you, you know, a small piece of meat and you get to live on, you get to live subsistence and then have to be forced march down to the beach again to get the next dead whale to bring to them. That's the world we live in today. That's what we're all railing against. And now all we have to do is say, you know what? We're not doing that anymore. Sorry. No, sorry, France. You don't get to take all of, all of um, uh, Niger's oil and gold and uranium and everything and pull it out for, you know, 0.1 cents on the dollar. You don't get to do that anymore. You're going to cut them in for 10%. Tough. And the problem is that the French economy is based on that shit being coming into their coming into their economy at that level, and they can't afford to give 10%. So they're going to fight it. And they're going to fight it through the fact that they have guns and they have somebody behind, standing behind them, the United States, up until recently, helping them to continue to do that. And uh, we just have to say, you know what? No. If they want to continue to fight like that, that's fine. We can leave NATO. You guys can fight for yourselves and you can figure out how you're going to get that, how you're going to make that work. That's my, that's my, that's my shtick. And I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay on that shtick until I finally convince everybody of it. There you go. Oh, beautiful. All right. Last, last two here. Sure. You're generous with your time. Um, what does it, is it me or does it feel like the, so in, in this vein, we've kind of been talking about the geopolitics and in the Malthusians and just this, we had global cooling, then there's global warming. Now it's climate change. Now it's energy usage, right? right. It just keeps shifting seemingly every decade, right? Mm-hmm. And no one seems to catch it at a macro level, unfortunately. And now we all of a sudden, though, have this nuclear thing where all of a sudden big tech is just, we are all, you know, go for liftoff uh, with big tech. You know, for decades, people are like, can we just use nuclear, thorium? Like, can we just do things where like we all can have we energy? Do, can we just do this? Right. Okay, right. So <laughs> it's clearly, it's clearly obvious that, um, yeah, no, it's clearly obvious that we turn the corner and everything is going to be nuclear. We're moving forward on nuclear power. Um, 
again, is, is, I'm really, really quick. Sorry. The la- last part of that is, sure. do you think AI before you answer it, do you think AI was like a Trojan horse almost for nuclear power usage? Like this is wild. Dave like, Collum this- tweeted out yesterday. And I, really? and I told Dave earlier. Yeah. So I tell Dave, that's so why I told Dave Collum like literally like two hours ago. I'm like, Dave, that was a great tweet. And you may be right about that. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, but I know that they're never going to, they're not going to power any of this stuff without, you know, nuclear power. And um, I just wish they would stop building these Gen 1 light water reactors that are, that, you know, we're sitting there making all this freaking nuclear waste that has to be cooled on a regular basis for the next 90 years with diesel generators. That's just fucking stupid. Like there's better technology out there. And, you know, Rosatom is building them all across freaking Asia. So can we stop with the, with the shitty Gen 1, you know, light water reactors that we, and the, can we get out of the uranium-238 cycle because we don't need to make any more fucking plutonium and make to make nuclear bombs. Like I've been on this freaking rant for how old are you, Brandon? 37. Okay. Um, since before you, since I was younger, since yeah, younger than that, I've been on this freaking thing since the nineties. Like it's just dumb, but wow. yeah, man, like it's not, it's not cool. Um, I think it's, I think they made the, they turned the corner on this one, the whole, Climate change thing failed when the when the Russians said, you know what, we're not doing that. And the Russians, I, I, I identified this about Russia like t- 12 years ago. I said, Russia, not only do they have all this oil, but they've got like the whole uranium supply chain up mid and downstream. Like they control all of it. They control the lion's share of the uh, of the yellow cake. They control they, they, they control all of it. And like, it's just, it's just so silly. Like we're, literally fighting the people like who have all the collateral like what are you what are you fucking doing and at the end of the day there are only you know so many good uranium deposits in the world and one of them is the Athabasca basin up in saskatchewan the other ones are in kazakhstan um there's there's still a few left in australia and then there's a couple in and i think there's a couple in russia there may be a couple of other other places but those are the big ones and you know we're going to need that uranium but here's the gig and we all know this. And anybody who's studied, taken five minutes to study thorium knows that freaking thorium is everywhere. We can Roomba this shit up off the beach because it's, you know, we literally can Roomba the shit up off the beach, right? Because salt water has enough thorium in it that you could literally just scrape it up and then power Miami with by just running a Roomba up and down the beach if we had the reactors to do it. And the thorium two, and the thorium 232 cycle is so much better. Because it's really the uranium two thirty three cycle, um, that you know, it's a fuel that goes until it's done. There is no waste. There, it's a one hundred percent goes. There's no critical mass. It just keeps going until it's gone. Because it's a, it's a, it's a neutron positive. It's a two point one or two point two neutron um, process. Um, meaning, for every neutron that it uses, it to, to get it going, it creates more than more than enough to keep going. So it's just, it's a self-perpetuating process. The uranium 238 cycle is not like that. So um, below a certain critical mass. So um, yeah, no, I think it's fascinating. And um, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with decentralization of the power grid. Um, Bitching for that for 25 years as well. It's nothing new. Like this is what we need to do, but political power is doesn't come from the end of a gun. Well, it does, but it also comes from the fact that the local power generation, the governance are... See, I mean, I've, I've argued with people for years about you know, the monetary system. I, I can think back to when I... Not argued, but you know, chatted about this. And I remember the first time I spoke to Daniel DiMartino Booth on my podcast, I asked her about the possibility of SOFA re-regionalizing the Fed funds rate and getting rid of that. And she just looked at me and said, yes, it could, but they're never going to give up that power. Uh, same thing with governments. They're never going to give up the power of being able to control your access to electricity. So, you know, I am fundamentally skeptical of these things because at the end of the day, it's easier to make a coal fired plant that can power a city as opposed to a big nuclear power plant that powers a state or most of the state, right? So think about, think, you know, be careful what you wish for in this. Like what I want, small modular reactors, decentralized power grid, energy trading, and all the and real energy trading, not that Enron bullshit. And um, but you know, I don't know. We'll see if we get there or not. So 
But, you know, we still live in a world of rampant authoritarianism, which is creakingly, which is creaking along, trying to stay in power. And we'll see if it, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see where we are in 20 years. I don't know where, I, I don't know where we'll be in 20 years, but um, I know that, you know, I'm going to look awful, awful like Joe Biden in 20 years. So I'm not really going to give a shit, but I'll, between now and then I'll, you know, do my best to care. So, and talk about it. So their last question was, what we got? What's, yeah, what's it sounds like a doomer about? when it comes to his lifespan. That's it. That's what we found out today. Is there... <laughs> just, I'm just a realist, dude. Like real, you said, oh, there you go. That, maybe that too, stupid. right? Just, I'm going to sit here and relight my fucking cigar and we're going to do this again, right? <laughs> like, oh, by the way. Oh, man. Unreal. All right. La- last one. Um, okay. And I'll let you go. Uh, what? So, you know, 35 to 65 year old male uh that's you know, okay. a lot of what youtube is uh, you know what a lot mm-hmm. just probably a lot of our content out there in these worlds gold world markets bitcoin right that's the demo generally what what are you doing you know what, what is your advice to someone in their young family maybe older family male uh how are you protecting your portfolio what are, what are you looking at here maybe oh, next wow. year the next 10 years that you're kind of just eyeing and keying in on what i would say is the following and I'm going to preface this. I don't know how to preface this. I've done a couple of podcasts with my friend Chris Sullivan uh, the, from Hyperion Decimus, the hedge fund manager at Hyperion Decimus, which is a crypto-focused hedge fund. And every time we get together, Chris and I talk about the, some variant on the same thing, which is wealth is not measured in, your, in digits. It's measured in hard assets. It's measured in the stuff you've acquired that has value to not only to you, but in the world. So you should always be looking in terms of how can I deploy my capital in such a way that I get more hard assets, which is real wealth. Because real wealth is is wealth that is assets that have value that have no counterparty risk. That's my definition of wealth, right? So if they've got marketable value, and they have no counterparty risk, meaning you own them and no one else owns them. Or if you do know what the counterparty risk is, um, you can quantify it, and it's very low relative to the um, relative to the value of the asset. For example, if you own your house, where you're still paying property taxes. Your counterparty risk is that you have to pay your taxes every year, and your taxes are some amount. If your house is worth you know, 300 grand and you're paying $1,500 a year in taxes because you live in the right county in Florida and not the wrong county in Florida, supposed to be six grand in taxes. Well, then you have less counterparty risk there because at that level, you don't have to worry about you. All you have to do is come up with a measly 1,500 bucks to continue to press this claim of property that you have. Okay. Same. Now, I want you to ask yourself how many layers 